that's interesting because especially um, what Bruno said also about um, reading religiously, I think you said. Some um, EU blogs. <laughs> <laughs> Worshipping. <laughs> <laughs> Worshipping, okay. But, because can I just turn to, to Sunny now? Like what what's the um, could you just give us an assessment of the, the British blogosphere at the moment? Like what the political um, blogosphere in Britain um, and, and if it's changed at all and especially I'm thinking in the last sort of five years, like how's it developed? I mean it's difficult to uh, tell you exactly how everything's developed in the last five years. I, I, I would say that clearly the, the environment around Europe is much more anti-Europe now than it was before. Um, from a left-wing blogger perspective who's broadly sort of pro-EU, I, I think the, 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 the problems that we face is that there isn't enough knowledge about what's going on and so you see some stuff that gets picked up by John, uh, James, uh, you know, who sort of write about these issues um, and then sort of either highlight them or, or write for us and then say, you know, this should be, and then that feeds into the broader conversation sometimes. I mean, for example, one of our most popular posts was uh, one by James about how many, how many of our laws do actually come from the EU. Um, and that was a very popular post, got went around everywhere because it broke down specifically claims by, uh, you know, Daniel Hannan, which are rubbish, claims by um, other think tanks about how many of our laws, including the uh, UKIP uh, leader, uh, Nigel Farage. So, so the point is that, you know, sometimes good analysis is hard to come by. And so when we do do it, it becomes very popular. It's very useful to, to do that. Um, the other one was uh, it's a really good story about how uh, Ian Dale ran this story about how, you know, um, the EU had banned uh, 12 eggs, you know, uh, selling eggs by the dozen. That, that was a front page uh, express story. Again, that was pure rubbish. And, and the, the point was, you, you're never going to expect the express, the Daily Express to retract, you know, they don't really care that much um, about facts. But we did attack uh, Ian Dale quite a lot um, on the issue, and, and I believe that he, you know, sort of put a, sort of not a retraction, but sort of said, oh, you know, all these lefties are getting angry, ha ha, etc., etc. And a few days later on, he sort of quietly just sort of accepted that maybe the story was rubbish. So, you know, I, I, I think the point I'm trying to make is that as things get more complicated or as the temperature is, is raised in uh, around Europe, it's difficult to from a left-wing blogger perspective to try and hit back at the constant drip drip of information from the right about what is going wrong there because we just don't have the capacity. But I mean, how much um, can as a blogger, how much of an impact can, can you actually have? I mean, do you need, what, it's the same question I asked Bruno, do you need the, the, the reach of the media in order well, to... Well, I mean, that can happen. I mean, I, I sometimes work for The Guardian and uh, there's been issues, uh, I mean, for example, we, we, we did a story about, someone passed us a video about how one of UKIP's uh, MEPs, um, Godfrey Bloom, had praised an attack on Greenpeace, you know, I mean, um, the, you know, the 1985 boat that they sunk, uh, that the French government did, actually. And so he, he praised an attack, you know, he, he has these videos <coughs> about climate change deny, deny, uh, denying videos, and basically he just hates anyone who talks about global warming, so, you know, he was in front of a, a Greenpeace boat. So, that, so the point I'm trying to make is that video then got uh, picked up by The Guardian, and then they blocked about it, and he had to retract his claim. And, and So those stories can get into the media. It's just finding the good story. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think, as Bruno said, it actually sometimes it's difficult to find those stories. Sometimes, actually, I think what works better is a rebuttals where you do get you know, uh, statements from EU press officers or other people saying the story in the Daily Mail or Daily Express or uh, on Guido Fawkes or uh, Ian Dale's blogs are rubbish, and this is why. And uh, you know, I, I think that's the that's the way we can head back at some of the stuff that gets put out. Well, John, um, you you've, you're you're you've probably been blogging about the EU for, for longer than um, I know, one of the longest running EU blogs, I'm sure. Um, what, what what is there an EU blogosphere? Um, it, does such a thing exist? Um, yes, such a thing does exist, and. Um, the, the organisation hosting today, um, bloggingportal.eu, is kind of the centre of that, I would say. But that's much smaller and much less developed than blogospheres in each national kind of political environment. 
Um, it's quite important, I would say, that we have meetings like this because that actually kind of builds a solidarity between people and meet each other and they can start to build projects. Blogging Blog Portal started around my dining room table. Myself, Andreas, who's here somewhere in the audience at the back, and Stefan Happer, our programmer, who's um, uh, in Brussels. Um, so you can build those sorts of things um, out, of, uh, out of meetings and, and solidarity that can be built. That encompasses 700 blogs at the moment, only about half of which are, are active on a week-to-week on a -week basis, and that covers all European Union languages and, and, and Catalan and Galician and a bunch of others. Um, so there is a European Union blogosphere, and in response to the question about to what extent the, the blogosphere can kind of set the news agenda, um, you may have been aware of one when it's during the Spanish presidency of the EU, the Spanish presidency website had been hacked, and if you search for Zapatero, you've got a picture of Mr. Bean instead. Um, uh, <laughs> EU blogs were the people who really kind of started ball rolling to get that um, taken up by the, um, uh, by the mainstream press. Um, there was actually a, a very um, a kind of critical attack on bloggers uh, by the Spanish Foreign Ministry initially, which then had to be retracted, and that actually helped kind of give, give the story some additional names. But they didn't take off until... <coughs> media well, but, yeah, of course, but that's fair enough. Like, I, I, I don't know, I can't speak, but well, I've probably got the kind of lowest blog readership of any of the people that have been speaking on these panels. Um, uh, and I think kind of, and most of those people are searching for tips to have to pass the commission entrance exam. It's not something that actually matters. Um, and so, um, essentially, I've, I've got to work <coughs> with others and work with networks and work with politicians in order to manage to deliver anything. Um, but what blogs can do, and I think that's important, is to cover the issues and the topics which otherwise wouldn't be covered um, by the mainstream press. I basically never write about summits. When is the only time when there are thousands of journalists uh, around, uh, around Brussels? It's when there's a summit going on. What have I got to contribute to a summit? I'm not there. Uh, there are the smaller issues of things around the edges where, where blogging can make a de decisive impact on your opinion uh, decision making. Oh. Yes, Bruno. Um, I just wanted to come back on a couple of things that, that the summit said, actually. I, I, I think it's very important that, at least, it's part of its lure and interest is that the EU isn't a, a left-right um, issue. Um, so I happen to be very left-wing, and one of the staunchest critics you can find um, of the European Union. So I would let's just kind of put that to one side. I think it reflects all some of the examples um, that you gave, where you know, yes, I, mean, I, I actually think that James's piece about where EU regulation come, came, came from, some of the pieces also look at the use of statutory instruments. Are, are very, very interesting. There's a serious um, bit of um, analysis that's hung as a hook on what some people have been saying, but it's away a bit from some of the kind of news trivia, the pantomime stuff about hacking the Spanish presidency website, mm -hmm. uh, you all, um, and a dozen eggs um, uh, a story as well. So, I mean, that's not, in, in one sense, how I find sometimes blogs quite disappointing, apart from the, the brilliant, heroic work that's done at um, a fistful of euros. Um, I can't find there has been no good blogging um, and analysis of what's been going on in Ireland. Which I, the most important event in EU history for the last 25 years, what's, what's been going on, what is still going on. There's been very, very little good analysis of like why this blog is going um, I think it's because that the, the blogs, there's no reason why bloggers should be um, kind of independent from developments in society uh, more generally. There's no reason why bloggers should be any better or worse. Um, and newspapers. Newspapers have certain advantages in their collaborative endeavours, they have disciplines, they have desks, they have deadlines, uh, and they have agendas. Bloggers usually have agendas too, but it's just their agenda. Um, I know from talking to bloggers, we all know, because we all live in the same kind of world, it's, people can get very demoralised, very, very um, easy. I, I, I'm defending bloggers, I think bloggers are brilliant, I mean, it's a good development in terms of public life, but I think it needs to go um, a little bit further. I don't really see, at the moment anyway, in terms of EU blogs, a dynamic that lifts the debate up. There are good examples when bloggers do really good, important work, but I don't see it as enough of a general trend where bloggers really lift up um, the debate, which is what I'd like to see. 